we have a great guest with us here today. Um, I think you've had a chance to read up a little bit about him already, but let me share with you some information about Mr. Kevin Cope. He is the founder, president, and CEO of Acumen Learning. He brings a variety of business and leadership experience involving working overseas in Europe for two years, starting several successful businesses, and being an executive in a Fortune 500 company. So you've got everything from entrepreneurial to corporate here. And after working for a large bank, Kevin joined the Covey Leadership Corporation, or Center, in 1989, where he served in several roles, including executive vice president. And after they merged with Franklin Company, forming Franklin Quest, or, or forming Franklin Covey, Kevin filled the role of president of international operations. Partnering with Stephen M. R. Covey in 2002, Kevin founded Acumen Learning, an organizational consulting and training firm that has served business Acumen courses to over 100,000 people in more than 30 countries. The clients include 16 of the Fortune 50 companies and many other organizations that you'll know, organizations such as AT&T, Coca-Cola, Chevron, Dell, Disney, GE, Rolls-Royce, Verizon, and Walmart. Not bad, huh? From 2008 to 2009, Kevin served on UVU's foundation board and is chairman of the finance committee. He currently resides in Orem, Utah, and loves spending time with his family. In his free time, he enjoys traveling to the beach, reading, water, and snow skiing and snowboarding. Uh, I'll also mention that his son Spencer is here with him today. Uh, again, look for the Johnny Depp look-alike. Where are you, Spencer? Are you here somewhere? Or he step out. He may have heard he's, the lecture before. There he is. He's coming in right on cue, <laughs> handing out the voting things. Thanks, Spencer. So we're glad to have a son with him here today as well. Anyway, he's a finance major within the Woodbury School of Business, so he's one of us. Anyway, Kevin? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Might wait till the end to see if it's worth it, but uh, glad you're here. Um, you know, my intent today is to uh, add some value for you. And so as I go through my presentation, if it's not meeting your needs, just raise your hand and ask some questions or stir me in a different direction. This isn't about me. Um, you know, I've got plenty to do, plenty of going on. So this is, you know, for the next 50 minutes, is, I'd really love to add some value, give you some insights, some ideas. And uh, so help me along as we do that. Um, first of all, you do have a voting pad, looks like a small calculator. First question is, are you interested in starting your own business? If the answer is yes, push, push one, no, push two, and maybe would be a three. And right up here I can tell how many votes, we're at about 140 right now, we'll wait just another second or so here. By the way, the receiver's right here, as long as you're pointing to the front of the room, it'll get your vote there. And it'll only take one vote, so. All right, your response on this one is, 53% uh, are saying yes, 14% no, and about 33% are maybe. So we've got 86% uh, of you are either like yes, definitely, or you know, possibility on that. Next question. Uh, what is your primary interest in starting a business? And then I've given a list of ideas up here, so select one of those ideas and, and push that button if you would. All right, that's the majority of us. We've got about 140 again there. And the answer on that, number one, to be your own boss. Boy, an overwhelming number one. Number two was to make a lot of money. And then number three would be, uh, I've got a good business idea, and then the others are kind of uh, sprinkled in there. So um, I, I wanted to spend a little bit talking about these things uh, as we go through today. So here's kind of an overview of, of what I'd like to spend our time on. One, um, give you an introduction of myself and kind of my career, kind of my you know, path in life around a career. Two, uh, give you an overview of my company. Three, uh, the downside and upside of being an entrepreneur or starting your own business. Um, so uh, having been through it a couple of times, uh, I'll speak to what I like and the challenges with that. Next, absolutes or attributes I believe you need to be an entrepreneur. And since 86% of you are sort of interested in that, hopefully this is timely. And then I'll offer some free advice. And since it's free, it may help you, or you may just toss it out, and it didn't cost you anything anyway. So hopefully this is on track for what you were hoping to get today. All right, um, so introduction to me. This is my family. Um, I've got uh, six kids. Uh, this is the Johnny Depp lookalike. I actually have three that attend UVU right now. Uh, Spencer here, Connor's a freshman, and Ryan over here. 
think he's in his uh, third year as well. So three of my six kids, and my oldest, Austin, actually went here and then graduated from BYU. He actually liked his experience here better than BYU. Uh, I graduated from BYU, but I love the experience that uh, the students get here. Um, so let me tell you a little bit more about myself and, and my career. I was a licensed cal- uh, contractor in California. I actually put myself through uh, college by uh, building homes in California, Utah here. So um, that was uh, one entrepreneurial start in business. Actually, um, could have stayed in construction for a long time, but decided that uh, ultimately I'd, I'd done a lot of it as a kid and through high school and was kind of looking for a change. Um, uh, from there, I got a business finance degree. Uh, BYU, uh, then was in a bank for three years and really enjoyed my time at the bank, was actually in a sales, but more of a commission sales role uh, at the bank and uh, was promoted to a position in California to head up all construction lending for this bank, pretty good size. Um, and uh, my dad became ill and lived here in Utah uh, with a terminal illness and decided to make a career switch, not because it was a career decision, but it was a family decision. And so I never intended to go in this direction of uh, being a part of the Covey Leadership Center other than I knew I wanted to be in Utah, and that was about the first job I could find or land. And so it was really kind of a serendipitous or, a, you know, a, a kind of an interesting path I took that way. I uh, was at the Covey Leadership Center for uh, 10 years, uh, as was mentioned. Uh, we merged with Franklin Covey. Um, loved my time there. It was really a uh, fast growth company. Uh, we literally were having an impact on the world, uh, an experience that, that's hard to replicate. I was a shareholder at Covey, and so when we merged, I had a stock, and at uh, age 37, I retired. Big mistake. Um, for a couple of reasons. One, I retired uh, because I had paper net worth that allowed me to retire. Uh, it was in Franklin Covey stock. It was at about 26 bucks at the time, uh, feeling pretty secure. It got as low as 67 cents. Um, Got down to $10 before we could even sell, and so the whole world changed. But I learned two things on that. Um, One, just because you can retire doesn't mean it's a good idea. Um, I just learned, and and I day traded for a while, too. That was a disaster as well. And uh, uh, what I found out about myself is I've got to be engaged in doing something. And I think many of us dream about, and me, you know, I did as well, dream about, boy, if I had enough money, boy, I'd, you know, I'd kind of relax, I'd go do things, I'd maybe read on a beach somewhere, and I, I think I thought I would be that kind of person, found out I wasn't. And so, because financially I had to get back in the game, and because um, personally I didn't enjoy, you know, being retired, uh, I unretired. And I joined an organization, then ultimately started this uh, in 2002, so it's been about 10 years now. So that's been kind of my uh, quick path um, with that. Now, this is the uh, Dow Jones Industrial Average over about the last uh, five years, 19, 19, uh, sorry, uh, 10 years, almost 15 years, 2007 to 2000, um, and about to where we are today. This is the great recession that we've just experienced and we're still trying to come out of. You know, the bottom of that was March of 2009, Here's where the Dow Jones is about today. So you can see the, the start, you know, the dramatic drop. And most people remember how tough this Great Recession has been, and we're still feeling the effects of that. I started my business right here. Uh, it was in 2002. It was after 9-11, uh, war, war in Iraq. This was a tough time to start a business. Um, I went from uh, being an executive of a company um, to making cold calls by myself in an office, picking up the phone and smiling and dialing. I gotta tell you, it was a rough couple of years in this startup. Um, I didn't take a paycheck for about two years. Uh, I put uh, probably about $200,000 of my own money in the business. And it wasn't until the end of about year two where we really took traction. I, I was lucky to get through that. There was probably many times that um, I really wondered had I made the right choice. Um, especially as I sat in there cold calling, smiling and dialing after in my career I'd run, I'd, at one point I think I had a couple thousand people that I was responsible for, $100 million, and uh, I was back to making cold calls. Uh, boy, that was a humbling experience. Um, in the end, it was a great experience for me because now that uh, our company is doing you know, pretty well, I genuinely appreciate the success this time around. When I got it earlier, I don't think I appreciated it. It, it, it came kind of quick. I was kind of young. 
But uh, having to go through and start a business and go through the, the challenges of that, I think really shaped a lot of how I feel today. I feel genuinely grateful to be able to pay my bills. Um, I'm grateful to have a warm home because there was a time in my career where I was starting to wonder about some of those things. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about our company. Um, we uh, average growth rate for the last uh, five years, 39%. Um, right now, we are number 1633 on the Inc. 5000 list. Uh, we are a multi-million dollar business. Um, clients, and these were already mentioned, some of our clients. Uh, Pre-tax profits is about five times our industry. One lesson I've really learned in being an entrepreneur, it's easy to get caught up in growth growing sales, getting really enamored with sales. And we've had good growth. But I'll tell you, uh, for me, a more important focus than growth is profit. Um, when you look at the dot-coms, uh, I think 12% of the dot-coms survived, uh, you know, the bust back in 2000, 2001. They were so enamored with growth that they forgot about making money. And so my focus has been profit first, and then if we can grow, that's great. Matter of fact, my new mantra is I want to grow as long as it's fun, it's profitable, and we're still making a difference. If those aren't happening, if it's not fun, if it's not profitable, it's not making a difference, I'm not interested in growth. And so uh, I think uh, there's a mindset with many entrepreneurs, many companies, we're gonna grow at any cost. Uh, I'm kind of in a different place than that. Now, if you're a public company, if I sold my company to investors, I'd have to rethink that whole strategy so one of the things about, I own 72% of my, my company, I have the right to decide how fast we're going to grow. If I got investors involved, outside investors, or I, sh I sold my stake, went public, that decision would be taken out of my hands. And so as an entrepreneur, I treasure more the ability to make decisions and dictate my future than I do getting a huge equity event or a lot of money through uh, you know, going public or an initial public offering. So that's a personal decision I've made, and right now I uh, really uh, want to stick kind of with that direction. And then, I, this was mentioned, uh, we've had uh, pretty good success and a good reach across the United States and across the world. We actually do no business in Utah, very little. We've done a couple of small things, but we work primarily with Fortune 50, 500 companies, and there just aren't Matter of fact, I think Flying J was the last one, or American Stores. So I don't. I think Utah may have zero Fortune 500 companies now. So we do a lot of work, and uh, you know Dallas has a, a, a huge number of Fortune 500. Southern California, New York area, Atlanta has a pretty good uh, bunch of those as well. So anyway, that's a bit about the company. Uh, our book will come out March 1st. That's been about a three or four year effort. We believe, we hope that this will help bring credibility to the company and kind of put us on the map. Title, Seeing the Big Picture, and it's really helping people understand how their company makes money. Which, matter of fact, is kind of what we do. It's, here's how, our primary course, we're a training company. We'll go into uh, corporations. We'll have anywhere from uh, frontline individuals up to uh, senior executives. And we spend one or two days in a live training session teaching them how businesses make money. We'll show them how their company is performing. We'll benchmark their company to other companies. We'll help them read financial statements. And so we've had a lot of success uh, with this training program. We're now starting to do this training program virtually. So we're doing it online. I've got somebody in the office right now teaching a Cisco class uh, from the phone and the internet. Uh, most of the Cisco classes he teaches are from about 10 o'clock at night to 4 o'clock in the morning because he's teaching primarily Asia on that. So that's kind of the essence of what our company does. We're moving more to uh, e-learning, uh, where uh, people can take it self-paced. And so we're trying to, we'll be branching out um, that way as well. But basically, we help people make better, smarter, faster business decisions by understanding how their company makes money, driving profitable and sustainable growth. Another way to think about it is we try and take the complexity out of business. So let me ask you this question. Grab your voting pad. What percent of business startups survive four years? What's your sense on that? Survive four years, so we're still standing four years. All right, your response on that, uh, that's the most common response. It's actually 35%, number three. 
Um, but still, the odds are against you. 35% make it, 65% don't. So about one in three companies will survive four years. If you go five years, of course, the odds drop on that. Um, another couple of statistics here um, in addition to that one. Uh, only 28% of their of CEOs keep their job uh, more than five years. So there's a pretty big turnover in CEOs as well, mainly because they, don't, you know, they aren't able to cut it. Another one, 70% of merger and acquisition activity does not live up to expectations. Um, companies are doing it all the time, but most, you know, seven out of 10 times, they don't pull it off well. They don't meet expectations. So, you know, again, making this case that business is tough. And so what we try to do with individuals is take the complexity out of business. Here's what we experience. Individuals and organizations are functionally brilliant, whether it's uh, sales, finance, marketing, um, operations, uh, they really understand their role well and do it pretty well. What they don't see is the big picture of how a company makes money. And so that's what we try and do, help people really see that broad picture. I, I'm in sales, but what can I do to drive our company's financial performance? Um, and we found that especially in this great recession of the last three years, the importance of this has taken off quite a bit. As companies have downsized, as they're doing more with less, they need individuals that really are clear on how they are driving company performance. Not just clear on IT, but really clear on how they can impact company's performance, whether it's drive revenues, lower costs, improve earnings per share. And so that's where we come in. And uh, it's also one of the pieces of advice I, I'm gonna give you at the end, but I'll preempt it now, is that you really gotta get clear. You've gotta really understand business and have business acumen. We define business acumen as understanding how your company makes money and acting to improve the business results of your organization. All right, uh, here's what I believe that, uh, you know, why I believe we've succeeded at uh, Acumen Learning here. I think we got five or six points here. One is hard work. Um, I, roll up your sleeves, kind of do whatever it takes to make the company uh, get off the ground. Two, uh, we've got good people. I love what uh, Michael Porter at Harvard said. He said, A's hire A pluses, B's hire C's. A's hire A pluses, B's hire C's. Why do B's hire C's? Yeah, so a B hires a C because it makes them feel better. Why else does a B hire a C? Okay, it wouldn't know what to look for. Anything else you'd throw out? Job security. If you're a B, maybe you don't want somebody uprooting you. What else? Okay, maybe, and they, they may not be willing to take the risk. So you'll find A companies, A leaders have the ability to attract A players around them. If you see B companies, B players, they'll be attracting Cs. Um, and so uh, good people is critical. Uh, if you haven't read the book, um, Jim Collins, Good to Great, one of his premises is you first get the right people on the bus and then you decide what role they'll play. Right now, we don't need to hire a, a consultant in our business, but we found a guy that's pretty good. And even though we don't need him, um, we don't have an opening for him, um, we're gonna make an offer and try and get this guy. And he's an A player. Even though we don't have a role, we're not ready for it, um, I think he's the right guy to get on the bus. Another reason, business acumen is a timely topic. I gotta tell you, there's a, a bit of luck on this one. Um, with the Great Recession, we actually had phenomenal growth because companies realized if we've got fewer employees doing the same amount of work, every employee better be really clear on the decisions they make and their ability to, uh, to improve our company performance, financial performance. And so we found that companies are really looking for business acumen. Uh, I saw a statistic that if you look at um, job postings right now, the mention of business acumen as a requirement in the job posting has gone up like 90% in the last three years meaning the companies aren't just looking for a good IT person, they're looking for somebody who really gets the big picture of how a company makes money. Uh, I'll, again, I'll throw that out as advice to you as you're you know, a year or two away from entering the job market as well. By the way, it's really easy to get information on a company. Uh, when you look at Google Finance or go to any finance website, um, you write this down, Form 10K, that's what the SEC uh, requires any public company to submit annually, Form 10K, Item number one in Form 10K is about a 15-page job description of the company. 
If I were interviewing with AT&T today, I would go download their Form 10-K. I would read item number one. Take, you know, uh, an hour to read those 15 pages. It will give you some pretty good insight as to what's going on in that business and, and describe the business. I was talking to somebody the other day that had a job interview, and the first question in the interview was, what's our stock price today? And the person didn't have a clue. Uh, but for me, those things are part of business acumen. It's having a real sense of how a company makes money, how they're performing in the marketplace. So before you ever get in front of an interview, with a, if it's a public company, find out what you can. Go on uh, Google, uh, search about that company. And there's a lot of good information. And Form 10-K can give you a wealth of that information as well. Um, another reason why I think we've done fairly well as an organization is we take a tough topic and uh, make it pretty engaging. I mean, we're teaching people about financial metrics, financial statements. I mean, people would rather get a root canal than um, really read and understand about financial statements. So we find people that come to our classes either recognizing that they've been at the company 20 years and don't know it, so they're nervous. Literally, uh, you know, I, I had an executive VP in a privately held company that, could, that didn't know what earnings per share meant. Now, if you're in a public company, earnings per share is one of the primary measures you report every quarter. It's one of two or three measures that Wall Street wants to hear about. This guy wasn't sure about earnings per share, an executive vice president at a public company. And so we find people that have been in business even a long time don't really have a clear sense of how their company is making money. Um, and then uh, next, very client-focused and customized. Um, you know, we'll bend over. It is, you know, remember my story about cold calling? Executive of a company, I'm back cold calling. Any lead, any client opportunity we had was like gold. And so we've learned to really treat with kit gloves any potential client opportunity. We'll customize, we'll bend over backwards. If they ask us to do something, we can't do it. We'll say, yes, we can. We'll figure out a way to, to pull it off. And so I think that's another reason why we've, uh, you know, been able to, um, you know, thrive in a, in a pretty tough marketplace. Let me just pause for a minute, see if anybody has a question before I kind of, please. Yeah, great, great question. So let me give you an example of where we'll bend over backwards and where we won't. Sorry? Oh, yeah. Question was, um, how far do you bend over for a client? Because there may be times where you could do it and lose money, and that wouldn't be smart either. So it's kind of the, how do you play that balance was the essence of your question, right? Yeah. So let me tell you where we won't bend very much now and where we will. Uh, I won't bend on pricing. Um, or I'm very tough to bend on pricing right now. I think we've established well our position. I found out that we lost an opportunity this last week because we wouldn't bend on our pricing. In, in my mind, the value proposition is clear. And uh, I, I state that with confidence in the front end of the conversation. And I find that 95% of the people are great with it. They just wanted to see what wiggle room they could get. So they'll literally, my wife's great at this. Um, she'll be in any store, anywhere, and simply ask the salesperson, hey, is this on sale? Can I get a 10% discount? Nine times out of 10, they'll say, well, let me check. They'll come back and say, yeah, we can give you 10% off on that. Companies will do that simply because it's an easy way to get a discounted price. Um, and uh, we're learning to just be firm on our price and hold so we won't bend there. Where we will bend is something we can do, but maybe they want it faster, um, even if we have to look, work harder to do it. And so if it's just a matter of working harder, doesn't impact our profit margins much, uh, I'm willing to bend over backwards and make it right. There are times where I'll fly to a client location, even if it costs us some money, but if I recognize that the profit margins are still there, I, I'm willing to bend over backwards. I, I also take a long-term view on it. I might be willing to lose money on the front end if I believe this is a three or four or five year deal um, on that. So I don't know if that answered your question, but thanks for asking. Please. Great question. The question was, what percent of our clients end up being long-term um, clients? Uh, most of our clients are, uh, be, you know, we're only about 10 years in business. And we've got several that have been with us for 10 years. So we're still kind of testing our average. I'd guess our average is probably about five years right now, uh, which is a big deal. Um, because once you sell it, it, it takes a lot more effort to sell a deal on the front end than it does to keep a client. And so we work very hard to keep them because once that sale is done, we want to get, you know, the, turn it into a cash cow, if you will, over time. Thank you.
Any other questions on that? Okay. So the downside and upside of being an entrepreneur, and I, I don't know, maybe you've heard some of these before. I don't claim to have any unique insight on this, but here's from my own experience the downside of uh, being an entrepreneur. Uh, number one, you will likely work harder than if you were an employee of another company. Um, and probably significantly harder than if you were an employee of another company. When you're running your own business, um, it takes significant effort. Like the cold calling I was describing before, I would never have done that for another company. But I would be willing to do it for my own company. Uh, so for those that were looking to be your own boss and maybe you know, have your free time and things like that, um, you likely won't get it like you would for real, you know, if you're working for, real, uh, for another company. Um, you'll be on 24-7. So you know, when I go on vacation, and you know, my son Spence is here, we, take, we try and take some fun vacations. Uh, my laptop's out every day. I'm connected to email. I'm getting a sense of what's going on. Now, not every entrepreneur is probably that way. I've got a friend who runs a company, and I think he can disconnect some. That's not my nature, not my makeup. Um, and I think for most entrepreneurs, you've got to stay pretty close to the business, pretty tied to it 24-7. Um, odds are likely that you won't survive. You know, again, the statistic is uh, if you start a business, um, you've got a one-third chance of making it in four years. It goes down at five, six years, et cetera. So uh, it's, it's a risk clearly a risk, a one in three chance of surviving uh, four years uh, kind of risk on that. And many people don't have the financial wherewithal to do that. By the way, what's the number one reason a company will fail if it does? I heard finances, capital, up here. it's money. Yeah, people, entrepreneurs, the number one reason if a company goes under is they underestimate how much money they'll need to run the business. They open a business thinking, hey, um, as soon as I open the doors, people are going to buy so many sandwiches from my shop. It will fund uh, my payroll, all my expenses. It doesn't happen. It usually takes three, six, 12 months, maybe a couple of years. Uh, Amazon took eight years to turn a profit. Eight years to turn a profit. Um, now, he had staying power because the idea was so big that he was able to do that. But that's unusual. Most companies don't have that kind of staying power. So, uh, by the way, number two reason a company will fail if it does, number one's cash. The number two challenge I found in The E-Myth is a great book. Uh, I think it's Michael Gerber wrote E-Myth, and he's got E-Myth Revisited. He talks about one of the big challenges of an entrepreneur is that they love riding bicycles, so they, ha they think, hey, why not go uh, open a bicycle shop? The challenge is, when you open a bicycle shop, it has very little to do with riding bikes, and it's all about business. Or maybe you love cooking, and so you're going to open a bakery. What you quickly find out is it's not about cooking. The joy of cooking goes out the door pretty fast, because now it's a business, and that's where most of your time is. And so the second challenge is people go into a business thinking, I love doing this activity. Why not do it as a business? And what they quickly find out is it's more about business than it is about that thing they loved doing. So something else to, to keep in mind. Another um, downside of being an entrepreneur, the, the buck ultimately stops with you. Um, you know, if you're an individual that kind of likes to bounce things off with somebody else and ultimately kind of have it be a joint decision, or uh, maybe you can have somebody else kind of help you make the decision, that not, being an entrepreneur may not be for you. Because if uh, you're, you know, the, uh, the leader of the organization, the CEO, founder, uh, ultimately, You've got to make the call. Ultimately, you've got to live with the decision. That fits with some people, but doesn't uh, fit with everybody. Questions on any of these, kind of the downsides of being an entrepreneur? OK. Let's look at the upsides. Here are some of the things that I've uh, found with that. Um, number one, you're your own boss. And I think that, was that the highest rated one we had, was being your own boss? Now, so that's the upside. But remember, what's the downside of being your own boss? Sorry? You are your own boss, okay? So you got to make decisions. You're going to work harder, um, and so you know your vacations won't possibly be real vacations. So, so there is an upside and a downside in doing that as well. I remember starting the business uh, ten years ago, and for the first couple of years, when we were struggling at times, thinking I would give almost anything to have a steady paycheck. I would work for anybody. I'd do almost anything to get that steady paycheck back. And so, um, being your own boss. Uh, uh, while it's great, also has that challenges as well. Uh, you can pick who you work with. Now, um, 
Uh, let me tell you another fact about my organization that goes counter to anything you're going to learn in business school. Um, I've embraced nepotism full on. Um, you, you saw my four sons. Spencer works with me. I, uh, a year ago, I had all four boys working with me. My oldest just graduated in April, so now there's just three. Um, I can't imagine uh, anything better uh, than being able to have my four boys in the business uh, with me. Coming to work and collaborating with Spence, we go to lunch. You know, my other sons, I, I love that part. I've also hired two brother-in-laws and a brother. Now, it's not great 100% of the time. Matter of fact, um, most people would advise you not to do it. It's working for me. And it's one of the reasons why I wanted to start a business, because I wanted to choose who I worked with, and I wanted to have a place where I could have my own family members work with me. So uh, we've kind of bucked the odds so far. Uh, it, there are times where I hate it like crazy, where there maybe is a performance issue, not with Spencer, but uh, maybe uh, somebody else. And uh, those are tough cir circumstances, whether it's a brother or a brother-in-law, and you've got to deal with that. It also creates challenges in the culture with somebody else who might wonder about favoritism. Uh, but overall, I think the, the upside is uh, more than overcome. For me, the downside in that. I'm not saying I'd recommend it to you, but for me, that's probably one of the biggest joys of running my own company is I, I get to, to work with my family. Please. Yeah. Idea, but the scenes, it might be yeah, so another, kind of the question is, have you ever had an outside advisor maybe done a cultural audit where people could honestly say, hey, it's worse than you think? Is that kind of the question? Yeah, yeah we've done a couple of things um, around that. Um, I've had twice external consultants come in and interview people anonymously with anonymous results to get a fill for that and have found that it's not an issue. Um, or it's not a big issue, I should say. There might have been a couple that wondered. And I think how I've overcome it, and Spence, I don't know if you want to chime in, is um, I, I think I'm pretty fair and clear about what I expect, no matter who they are. And I kind of stick with that. So, you know, I'm, I'm just as tough on, you know, a brother or brother-in-law as I am on somebody who's not. Spence, of course, there's only one right answer now. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't know if you heard that. He says I'm actually tougher on family than I'm on their others. I cut you off. Did you finish what you were saying? Yeah, yeah. So, I, so maybe that's one of the saving graces to working with family. Yeah. Any other questions on that and kind of the idea of nepotism or working with family? Most people tell you not to do it, and that's probably good advice. Uh, we've just kind of figured out to make it work, uh, how to make it work for us. Um, although you can lose big, you can also win big. So another advantage or upside of uh, owning your own business. For those that do make it, um, there's an opportunity to do well. If you read The Millionaire Next Door, I think it was out like 10 or 15 years ago, another great book. It talked about the average millionaire tends to be a person next door that you would never guess. The people that look like they have a lot of money generally don't have a lot of money because their big house, their nice cars are all mortgaged. Most of the millionaires are folks next door living in a, a normal size home. Uh, they don't have much debt. They've slowly saved over time, and they're doing pretty well. They shop at J.C. Penney's instead of Nordstrom, so they're just a little more careful. Uh, it also shows that most uh, millionaires are those who have actually started their own company. And so um, it's, uh, when it goes big uh, or it does well, it's an opportunity to earn some good money as well. So another upside of being an entrepreneur. And then last, uh, you have a sense of creation. Um, I love the idea of creating a culture in uh, our organization, of getting a sense of building a team uh, that's trying to accomplish great things. I love the idea of people 10 years down the road looking back and saying, man, that was one of the best career experiences of my life. And so uh, we're actively working to build a strong culture in our business, one that people not only make a good paycheck, but they actually uh, enjoy working at. They get meaning, fulfillment um, out of that as well. And so I really, for me, that's a big part of why I love being an entrepreneur, is this idea of creation. I'll tell you, um, by the way, who left, uh, there was a news yesterday, a famous founder, CEO of a company just left the company. Yahoo, Yahoo who, who left? Yahoo? Just, I just know that was a corporation. Yeah, Jerry Yang. He, he was the co-founder of Yahoo, had been there forever. About two years ago, Microsoft tried to buy Yahoo. I think they offered at least double the stock price. 
Um, it was like, I don't remember the exact figures, like 34, 36 bucks a share for Yahoo to have been trading in the teens. They rejected it primarily because Jerry Yang, the CEO of Yahoo, didn't want to sell his company. And here they are, you know, a year or two later, the, the, the value of the company has dropped dramatically from where Microsoft would have paid. And so here's the upside of owning your own business. You've got a sense of creation. I mean, this, my company for me was like birthing a child. When I think of what I went through for it, the downside is I'm not very objective about my company. I'm not objective about what it's worth. If somebody wanted to buy it, I would price it a lot higher than somebody else, as Jerry Yang did with the Yahoo. So he needed to get out of the way, and Yahoo will probably break up some degree and you know, sell itself off, maybe to an Asian investor. And so the upside is you have a sense of creation, but there may come a time where the company needs to move beyond you, potentially, if you want it to grow, and you may have to step aside. Uh, Again, my philosophy, I'm going to grow as long as it's what? I, I said three things. Do you remember those three? I'm going to grow as long as it's profitable, fun, makes a difference, yeah. And so for me, I don't have an end game of going public or selling this off, and I have that right. Uh, but if, you know, if you're looking to take it public, just recognize it, there's a, a whole different dynamic at play there. question was, if, uh, if I felt like if I sold the company, I'd lose my ability to create and kind of lead the company. I, there was a question, dramatically. I believe that would be the case. There are some unusual examples where that does happen. Uh, Zappos. Anybody familiar with Zappos? Uh, unfortunately, my wife loves Zappos. The shoe, you buy shoes, they ship them to you free. You, if you don't like them, you ship them back. Um, Tony Shea's the CEO of Zappos. It was bought by... Amazon, I think about a year ago now, in his bio, because he has a unique culture. Matter of fact, interesting story, they're based in Las Vegas. They have a six-week onboarding process. First of all, getting hired there, uh, you interview multiple interviews, they're looking at culture fit as much as they're looking at business chops and understanding in the role. Um, once you get on, which is tough, you're in an um, orientation process for six weeks. Part of that's including, no matter your role, you're on the phone servicing customers for a week or two. At the end of six weeks, they'll offer you $4,000 to leave the company. The whole idea is they want to make sure you're really committed to be there. And what Tony Shea um, describes is that the people who end up staying after six weeks have had to remake the decision and are definitely committed to being at Zappos. And so but my whole point with that is, in his clause where they were bought by Amazon, he made it clear they wanted to be an independent, separate operating unit. And as long as he's performing, they'll allow him to do that. I would imagine if their performance drops off, Amazon's gonna come along and say, hey, Tony, you know, sorry. So uh, to, in short, if I were to go public or my company were to be bought, I'd lose, a, I, I'd lose control of the company. I wouldn't be able to shape it the way I wanna shape it. And so it really would be a decision of trading in all of the reasons why I wanted to own a company for cash. And uh, you know, I, I've got a, a decent lifestyle. I don't have huge expectations and needs in life. And so that's why it works for me. I don't have a need to go public. If your, your end game is to get a big payout and you want to go public, you realize you will lose control. Um, can't dictate your own future. And it will be a whole different you know, company from what you had. question is, since I'm at the top, meaning CEO, CEO, it doesn't mean I'm the smartest, but I just happen to be the CEO. Um, how much am I involved in? Um, you know, I'm going through a real kind of interesting phase right now. I tend to be a little more, Spence will tell you, hands-on, a little more kind of a control freak. Love to watch the detail. In the last two years, I've had to really shift because we're getting to a size where I can't possibly be involved with everything, and it was a tough move for me. So I've created uh, three team members, or three teams. So I've, I've kind of delegated a lot of what I do to three consulting teams, and then I've got a, a marketing person. So I've got kind of 14 guys that are the leadership position, and I literally have had to step back and say, look, I'm giving you a revenue goal. You've got this amount of money to spend. Go figure out how to do it. And that's been hard, but I think it's the right way to go. We can't grow beyond where we are now with me doing that to a degree. Now, I still have my finger on the pulse. We still meet monthly. I'm a data freak, and so I constantly have measures coming in that tell me how we're performing.
but um, that, that's a shift that's not, wasn't easy for me to make, but I, I think it's the right thing and we're kind of getting through it okay. Thank you, please. How do you feel about a succession plan for your company since you've been paying these bills? Yeah. Yeah, um, you know, I have. Um, actually, uh, uh, I do have a succession plan in place and, and one that um, I think is maybe not as transparent as could be. It's transparent between he and I and several other folks. Um, it's actually going to be a brother-in-law who uh, right now is the succession plan in the company. Um, we're probably, I've told him, I said, look, I don't want to retire. Here's what I want to do. You know, I want to teach. Uh, I want to do some writing. I want to do, you know, uh, larger presentations, but I think the day-to-day -day I'm going to have to turn over, so I'll probably do it in pieces. It might be first a president role, then possibly a CEO role, and I'll be like, you know, chairman or something like that, but it, it'll probably go in pieces, but I've had to be kind of clear, especially since there could be feelings if, if one brother-in-law and brother says, hey, I thought I was the guy, so um, I've, I've had to be somewhat transparent. I think I need to do a better job of it, though, quite frankly. I don't plan on dying anytime soon, but um, I, I do need to do it ahead of time. We've got just, uh, let me see, I'm showing about five minutes, six minutes left. Let me jump, uh, I had a whole bunch of other stuff that I thought might be interesting, but let me jump to kind of um, interesting story about Bill Gates. Um, if you haven't read about Bill, read his story. A lot of people, you know, there was a lot of luck, but Bill Gates, that guy had more programming experience at 21 than, uh, there were probably only 30 or 40 people in the world that had as much programming experience by the time he was 21. Uh, you look at his success and think, man, right time, right place. The guy worked his tail off. Uh, when he was in high school, he was actually, for a semester in high school, hired by the nuclear plant that just went in and uh, somewhere up in the Northwest, and he was the guy they hired to do the programming because as a high schooler, he's the only guy that could have done the programming. Anyway, I was going to make that point about success. There's a lot of luck, but also a lot of preparation. Tipping point, Malcolm Gladwell is where I got that story. Great book. He also talks about the Beatles and how much work the Beatles had done. How, uh, you know, 10,000 hours of practice is kind of what it takes to be an expert. Anyway, pick that book up, another one. Let me uh, jump to some free advice, and we'll kind of end with that. Maybe we'll have a minute or two for some last questions here. Um, you guys might like this. Get all the education you can now. If you think, I'll graduate, and then down the road, maybe I'll get my you know, MBA or something like that. Now, I know, you know many MBA programs want you to get a couple of years. It just is tough. When you leave, you get a family, you get a boat, you get a car, you get bills. It's just really tough to get back to school. Get all the schooling you can now, um, because it'll just, it, it won't happen later uh, easily. It'll be a real effort to make that happen, so get all you can now. Two, don't let work be the dominant focus of your life and that, unless that's what's most important to you. I've got a friend um, who's a, a surgeon, and he basically was not around for the raising of his two kids. They only had two kids because uh, she was doing it on her own. He wasn't around. I think he's comfortable with the sacrifice he made with the number of school, years of school, but it definitely was a sacrifice, and work was his dominant thing. Um, uh, Peter Lynch, the, uh, he, he was the head fund manager of Fidelity. Uh, one of the, the breakaways, this is about 10 years ago, he decided to retire at the top of his game. Somebody asked him, what are you doing? I mean, you're at the top of the game, you're retiring. His comment was, nobody on their deathbed ever wished they would have spent more time at the office. And so many folks advanced in their career oftentimes look back and have regrets that they didn't balance uh, their life. So, but my point here is don't let work dominate your life unless you really want it to, and then that's pretty easy to let it happen. Um, my experience is, is the world will drive us to be work-focused, to be consumer-focused. It won't drive us to be balanced around life, uh, around family, and so you really have to fight hard to make that happen. Also, uh, let your confidence lie not in a job, but in your ability to produce. What I mean by that is don't get so caught up, at have your ego and your confidence be in your current job because jobs can come and go, even if you're doing a great job, whether it's a layoff or merger and acquisition. So get your confidence in life, in your career, not from your current job, but with the sense that um, I've got the ability to produce. If it's not here, I've got the confidence in myself to do it somewhere else. If you do that, it will help you be a better employee. 
Um, you won't do things that go against your principle because you know you don't have to have that job, that you've got the ability to produce. Those people that are anxious and desperate for a job might sell out throughout their career and throughout their life. Um, never burn a bridge. I had somebody um, uh, leave our organization a couple of months ago, and on their way out, they uh, did a little bit of grumbling. They had a, an offer, great offer for them. Did a little bit of grumbling. Um, about two months later, um, they're interested in coming back to the organization. And uh, it, never burn a bridge. You, you never know. It's just a small business world. Um, the guy at Southwest, no, not Southwest. Who's the flight attendant? What airline? Grabbed the beer, jumped down the slide. Is it JetBlue? The, the guy's a hero to many folks, but the guy will have a tough time getting a job. Um, and so even though it may feel like you want to go out with a grand slam and tell your boss off, don't do it. Um, be polite, be kind, give, you know, give uh, balanced feedback, but don't ever burn a bridge. And then last, uh, build your own business acumen. Um, you know, many of you are in the, you know, in the, in the business school here. Um, get really clear and be a student of business. Uh, get on Google Finance, Yahoo Finance, regularly stay attuned to what's happening in the business world. Um, you, uh, don't just be functionally smart, whether you're an accountant or a finance person, be business brilliant. Um, we've got maybe just a minute or so here for questions. Anybody have a last question or so they wanna? Please. Uh, I, I like the idea of a franchise. I was talking to somebody up here. I think Subway's the most successful franchise opportunity right now. Uh, you know, it's still, a, a lot of it's in your court. So I still see that as an entrepreneurial opportunity. And people do pretty well in the franchise world. So I like that. It's a lower risk way to, to be an entrepreneur. What do you feel is a better approach to getting into real estate? Being highly specialized or very well-rounded? Better approach to get into a business. Yeah, it depends on what you're hiring for in the role. You know, so if I'm in the IT department, I'm looking for somebody who's pretty smart at that. Um, if I'm looking for an IT manager, I'm looking for somebody then that needs business, you know, smarts and business acumen. I, for me, it's tough to do an either or. I think you've got to have both. You've got to be brilliant at the function, and you've got to be great at that broader understanding of business.